Welcome to another episode of the Flats Nation Podcast. And a big shout out to Brother Dave Fader down Amarada for the awesome music. You can check out more of Dave's phenomenal work on davidfader.com. This is your host Dave Legier and from my old home fishing grounds up in the Tampa Bay area. I'm very happy to have my good friend Captain Mike Anderson join us. We're going to discuss fishing, gear, some conservation issues, and some sponsorship related topics at the same time. Sprinkled in will probably be a little radio and TV media business tips. So it should prove to be educational and I hope you enjoy it. So now, let's get on with the show. Well, good afternoon. Today we have my good friend, Captain Mike Anderson with us. I have known my brother in arms for quite a while now. I've been a guest on his radio show. That was really fun. It derailed into a political chat as we solved all the world's fishing problems because we were right and many are just wrong. Brother Mike, welcome aboard. It's great to have you with us today. Hopefully we can stay on topic, but I seriously doubt it. How are you doing? I'm really good, buddy. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. I uh, thought I'd go through some, some questions and get everybody caught up and see how things are going. So uh, how did you get your start fishing as a kid? Well, like most people, you know, it, it, it for me, it was family. My, uh, my father loved to fish, my grandparents, you know, both sides, my both granddads loved to fish. I had an uncle who uh, was four-time world walleye fishing champion on the PWT Wow! Uh, up there out of Wisconsin. And uh, my dad ended up retiring from Mercury Outboards. So, you know, I've been fishing since I was a little kid. I remember running around with my buddies on our, on our bicycles with little plastic tackle boxes and, and one rod in, in the hand, one hand on the handlebars and just trying to get to the little creeks and little ponds. And I grew up really close to uh, <clears throat> Lake Winnebago, which is uh, a really great walleye and perch lake. Uh, now, as I guess is what I'm being told, it's a pretty good bass lake too. Lots of smallies and things like that. So I grew up pretty close to the water. Um, and my later years, as I got to high school, we lived on the water. So, awesome. Uh, yeah, fishing was, uh, was, you know, we had plenty of opportunities to get on the water. So it was great. So basically you have one hand on the handlebars and the other hand on your Zebco 202. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> remember pretty when much. She, you remember when fishing was that inexpensive? Oh yeah. Yeah. Heck I, I even, I think we were advanced. I think I had Mitchell 300s. Wow. At the time. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, is... we, uh, yeah, no doubt. It's, it's crazy how the, uh, the sport has evolved, you know, over those, you know, 30, 40 years. It's crazy. Yeah, and gotten a lot more expensive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just like every, just like <laughs> everything else. Right. We used to ride on bicycles. Now we ride on skiffs and expensive bay boats. Exactly. It's amazing. So how did you get your start becoming a guide? And, and you've been guiding now, what, 20, 21 years, something like that? Yeah, I think uh, last July was 22 years. So this wow. July will be 23 coming up. So it actually was never – you know, it was never a, a vision. It wasn't something I thought about as a kid. Um, I, I got the saltwater bug pretty bad and I was fishing, you know, just as much as I could possibly fish. I was uh, running an aluminum company that I had started and, and built up to do pretty well. And um, that afforded me the luxury to have a boat and, um, you know, my weekends pretty much off and I was either playing softball or I was fishing. And then what really happened was I was spending some time hanging out with Captain Billy Nobles. Um, a mutual friend had booked a charter. Uh, we were buying a lot of supplies from him for the aluminum business, and he wanted to thank us with a snook charter. So he said he, he knew a great snook fisherman in his neighborhood, a captain, and it just happened to be Billy. So we spent a day on the water with Billy, and, uh, and I just, you know, Billy and I got to be friends got to the point where, you know, he was telling me where bait was and we were just kind of conversing on the phone. And then one day he called me and said that the, uh, the inshore fishing association, the IFA. Oh yes. Was, now we're going was, back. Yeah. It was starting a, uh, a redfish tournament trail and just wanted to know, if, you know, what I thought and if I was interested in, in competing in it. And again, because of 
uh, the good Lord's blessing covering me with the aluminum business and all that. I'm like, listen, buddy, I'll pay the entry fees. We'll split the expenses. You and I fish it together. And Billy jumped all over it. So we were in Jacksonville many, many moons ago, probably 23 years ago, I would think, 24 years ago, maybe uh, at this time. And uh, we were there at the very first one. And, uh, you know, Billy had been guiding for a while. He was in with a great group of guides, uh, Artie Price and Dave Marquette and Jamie Goodwin. Um, there was just a, you know, when I think about it now, really an impressive group of, of guides. And we were all sitting around after the captain's meeting at a local sports bar somewhere trying to get a cold beer and some food in us before the, the next day, which was, you know, the first day of the tournament. And they were all giving me a hard time because everybody had captain on their shirt, but me. <laughs> and I didn't think too much about it really, you know, just take the rib and it's all good. But the longer Billy and I were on tour, the more I could see that it was beneficial. If you were a captain, you know, you might be able to pick up a couple of sponsors, you know, get some lures and get some things that could help you on the tour. Um, so my initial brain infusion on the on the whole the, hey let's go get our captain's license was really you know just to kind of help us out on the tournament scene a little bit um and then as i got my captain's license and then i was fishing and billy started ribbing me he's like hey bro you know i'm giving trips to these guys and then i'm checking with them on the same day i'm checking with you and you're catching more fish than they're catching and you know why don't you just run some trips on the weekend so the next thing you know, here I am kind of corralled into this thing, running trips on the weekends, running my aluminum business Monday through Friday. Uh, we owned a West Shore pizza at the time. I was just crazy swamped. Um, my no, rest no rest for Yeah, my, my wife was pregnant with, uh, with our youngest daughter. And uh, it was just, I was just super, super busy running, gunning. Um, and I did that for several years. And then... Uh, the aluminum business just got hard, um, you know, dealing with the counties, dealing with employees. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I had two partners in the business. Uh, we were doing extremely well. The economy was rocking. Things were growing. Um, we really had more work than we had guys to do it. Um, and that was part of my frustration. And one day I just, I said, hey, I, I've had enough. I'm, uh, I'm going to walk away. And I'm, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go be a fishing guide and fish tournaments. And I'm just going to, I'm going to go to the water where I'm a little more relaxed. And I'll never forget the look on my wife's face when I came home that day and told her I'd walked away from the aluminum business. I was still going to be the license holder. So I still had a little piece of it. You know, they were still helping me out a little bit uh, financially, but you know, nothing that we like we were accustomed to. So right. I was pretty much putting, all my eggs in that, you know, charter captain basket, which, you know, looking back on it, wasn't the greatest, probably the greatest move at the time, um, you know, just really risking everything. But, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because you, I'm, I'm really spiritual and I believe that, that God puts you in places. He introduces you to people. Um, he sometimes makes you feel uncomfortable and we don't really know why. We don't know that what we're doing is the best thing, but, you know, we're doing a thing. And sometimes it's a thing we like, and sometimes it's a thing we don't like. But in this case, I think that was the path that God wanted to put me on, you know, because shortly, you know, after that, the, the, the well, actually, actually, the radio show started, I was still part-time, but, you know, next thing you know, we're doing radio on Sunday mornings. And, you know, then the TV show kind of came into light with Channel 8, and it just, the fishing thing just kind of, it looked like I could make it explode if I walked away from the aluminum. So that's what I did. And again, I believe that, you know, that was a, the direction that God wanted me to go and, and that, that could, you know, lead me to whatever vision he had for me. I agree. Amen. Now you were a fill in, weren't you for captain Mel before you actually got his show? Well, yeah. And so, so just to give you a background, so we were on, we were on 620 WDAE, the sports animal at the time, an iHeart station, just like Cat Mel. Cat Mel was 970 WFLA. So we were in the same building under the same umbrella. Mel was on Saturday. We were on Sunday. <clears throat> um, and we were on for, 
you know, close to 10 years uh, before I got the phone call from Captain Mel. And Captain Mel and I were friends. Billy, we were all friends and buds. And, you know, we never stepped on one another's toes. Obviously, we didn't want to we didn't want to do battle against Captain Mel Berman, who had, you know, just literally, you know, three hours of radio on on uh, on Saturday mornings, you know, just untouched. The numbers, the listenership was crazy. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I mean, I went fishing with Mel and I sat in on some of his shows and just, uh, you know, miss him to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had that. He had that personality. He just did. He was a he was a professional broadcaster who loved to fish. And that it, it just it all came through in his ability to do that show and reach people. So um, which coming up, as a matter of fact, uh, we're, we're doing this podcast, not to date it for you, but we're actually doing this podcast the week of the 12th memorial of us losing Captain Mel this Saturday morning will be the 12th year of me doing the show. Mel will have been gone 12 years on Friday. God, where does the time go? Yeah. Yeah. You're telling me. So it was kind of crazy because I got a phone call from, uh, from Captain Mel um, uh, about, I don't know, maybe two weeks prior. And he asked me, uh, he said, Hey buddy, um, I got to have some heart surgery. And it's not really a big deal. I'm going to be okay, but they want me to sit out, you know, kind of take it easy for a month. <clears throat> and I said, well, I, you know, he said, you know, I, would you be interested in sitting in for me and hosting while I was gone? And of course, you know, just the fact that Mel even mentioned it was mind blowing to me. Um, you know, through the start of my radio career it was my goal was that when Mel retired, I would know that I had done a good job if, if the people at iHeart interviewed me or considered me for the position. Right, right. Now that doesn't mean I wanted the position <laughs> necessarily because I had it's, no it's some big shoes to fill. That's for sure. Brother. Well, yeah. And, and I, I had not even thinking like that, just thinking I already got a show on Sunday. I damn sure don't know if I want to show on Saturday right. too. So um, I, I, I mentioned, I'm like, listen, Saturday's a big charter day for me. I really, you know, I don't know if I can take the whole month of February off and I'm making money. And they were like, no, 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 dude, we're going to, we're going to pay you. And I'm like, well, hey, February, man, let's go fronts. I'll, you know, I'll take the money. Let's, let's rock and roll. I'm honored you'd ask me. So anyway, the, the Friday before the first Saturday, which would technically be this Friday coming up 12 years ago, um, we were in a meeting, Billy and I were in a meeting with News Channel 8, a huge meeting, a lunch meeting with the GM at the time. And my phone is in my pocket. And Dave, it is vibrating like every 20 seconds, like to the point where I'm like, I'm like, really, like I'm physically pissed because I'm thinking it's my wife. I'm like, you know, this better be the, she knows I'm in a meeting with, you know, the channel eight people. About it better TV be good. Show and other, I'm like, this is, this is crazy. Why the hell is, so I get out of the meeting and it was probably, 12 30, 1 o'clock when we climbed out of the meeting and I look at my phone and it's it's Vance Tice, it's Bill Miller, it's I mean the, the phone calls just poured in that Captain Mel had passed away during the procedure. They lost him. Yeah, I remember. I remember. He died on the table. So I, I was on my way. I was literally on the cross town here in Tampa, headed for Brandon, which is totally the opposite direction of the station. I literally got off at the next exit and worked my way back to uh, iHeart Media there. And I walked in the program director's office and I thought he was going to throw up. He was like, oh my God, thank God you're here. I can't believe you're here. And I'm like, well, I didn't know what else to do. I'm like, I'm supposed to do the show tomorrow. What, what are we going to do? And just at that moment, uh, a guy by the name of Dan DiLoretta, who was the GM there at the time, who was a great man, a great GM, just a, a we're friends to this day, great human being, great fisherman. He, uh, he walked right in the office didn't sit down, didn't say hello, didn't do nothing, pointed right at me and said, hey, can you do the memorial show tomorrow? And I, without blinking, I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. We'll get it done. And uh, they were like, okay, well, there you go. You got it. Handle it. So I immediately called Bill Miller, called Vance Dice. I wanted to surround myself with incredible people that could, that could help me through this because I knew this was going to be bad. Mel Berman, Mel Berman helped 
so many people, so yeah. many guys, myself so many included. Business. Oh God, Dave, it was, it was a three hour show at the time. And it was the worst three hours of radio I've ever done in my entire life. Um, crazy. Uh, grown men, Woody Gore, you know, great fishermen would call in and couldn't get through the call, breaking down, crying. And it was just awful. Um, we had phone calls for three hours straight. And anyway, I signed off. And then when I signed off, I broke down, um, got out of there, finally went to sleep because I, I, I obviously didn't sleep at all Friday night. And um, Monday morning, I got a call from Dan DeLoretta's secretary that Dan wanted to see me in his office Tuesday morning, nine o'clock, if I could make it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I can make it. And I, uh, I walked into Dan's office Tuesday morning and he said, listen here, chief, I'm not interviewing anybody else. You need to take this job. <laughs> and I said, well, I, I got a fish on Saturdays. I mean, and he's like, listen, get your wife on the phone, come up with a number. I'll try to make it happen. So I, you know, called my wife and said, ah, you know, what about, he wants me to take this show full time. So, and, and, and it all worked out. We ended up, you know, I gave him a number, he jumped all over it and, you know, 12 years Saturday. Uh, Amazing. We, uh, yeah, we will have been doing the Saturday show, the Sunday show, and April 1st will be season 16 of Real Animals TV. So uh, I, I, I often, I, I don't, I don't know what exactly why God has me here, but other than to just try to reach people in a, in a positive light, um, Amen. you know, through, through fishing and, uh, and, and just, you know, I, 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 I really don't, I can't, I can't put my finger on it, Dave. I don't, I don't understand all the blessings. I'm not sure why it's all come together, but I'm sure enjoying it. Well, I remember that was probably one of the hardest things I have done other than being in the military. Uh, taking Captain Mel's phone number out of my cell phone at that time, yeah, you know, nice. because it's yeah. like, it's like a closure, you know, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but Mel and I were friends and we got a chance to fish a couple of times and it was just, you know, it's just hard. It, it's just hard. Um, so now how long have you had the, the TV show? Real Animals has been it's on for season, season 16. CA and I flats class. We started the same year. So we're both on, on, for me, um, I'm not sure when CA starts his season, but my season will start April 1st. So I will be, season 16 will launch April 1st. So it launches second quarter for me. So again, you know, just a, a ridiculous number. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a whole nother crazy story. I mean, just how that whole thing evolved and how it happened and getting to spend 10 years at News Channel 8 doing the show with them. We did 200 and 22 episodes in 10 years there wow. um, yeah and then I just to, to just be perfectly honest I just got tired of the whole you know corporate scene pretty much um, it, it's just tough to work in that environment and uh, so you know I, I was going to shut it down I was literally going to walk away after 10 years and just say you know the heck with it I, I just don't know that I'm going to I'm going to pursue this and my camera guys from News Channel 8 said, listen, buddy, you know, we do a lot of shows. We think you're pretty good at this. Um, you got a good following. You know, maybe you should find your own production and just do the show yourself, which is what guys like C.A. Richardson and Blair Wiggins. And sure. Murphy, they've been doing that for years. Um, and I actually got C.A. on the phone and C.A. kind of laughed. He's like, Mike, buddy, you, you're everybody loves you. You're, you're popular in the industry. You're a good guy, dude, get a production team and do it yourself. It's, it's easy. I've been doing it. So, you know, those people talked me into trying to get it rolling. Um, I didn't have a boat sponsor at the time. And, and in order to do it on your own, you know, production costs and things like that, buying the airtime on the, on the networks isn't cheap. No, it's expensive. CA and I have talked about it. It is not cheap at all. I always laugh because you, you, I get, youngsters and people coming to me all the time you know hey i'm doing this and then i'm gonna do it i'm doing a tv show just like yours and i'm like okay great you need a quarter of a million dollars if you don't want to make any money that's right that's a break you need a, you need a quarter of a million dollars just to break even. so it's it's not little and, and anyway my 
I, I wasn't sure that I'm looking at my financials and I'm like, I, I, I can do it, but I can't make any money doing it. And my wife's in my ear saying, well, maybe year one, you don't make any money. And I'm thinking to myself, I can fish a charter every single day. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing this for free. I'm just not going to do it. 10 years of my life dedicated to it. If it doesn't help me pay the bills, I'm not going to do it. Um, and I needed, what I needed was I needed a boat, I needed a boat sponsor. I needed a big sponsor, one big sponsor lick to make it make sense. And um, I, I was so sick and so worried about it, Dave. It was crazy. It was just driving me nuts. And finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put this at your feet, Lord. I'm going to let the good Lord handle this. If you want me to continue doing the show, reach people in a positive way, all that good stuff, then that's what I'll do. If not, then obviously you want me to go down a different path and that's where we'll go. No big deal. About two weeks later, I was at an event out in Winter Haven with uh, my good friend, Captain Rick Murphy. And Rick was at the time was tied to contender boats. And I had mentioned to Rick, I knew he wasn't contender bay boat. He was contender big boat because he's Pathfinder Maverick guy. Correct. And uh, <clears throat> I was like, hey, what's the deal with that bay boat you all got over there? And Rick lit up like a Christmas tree. He's like, hey, this is what we'll do for you. We'll do this. We'll do that. We need you to run the boat every day. Blah, 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 blah. We'll get you hooked up. No problem. And I'm like, huh? Really? So about a week later, I text Rick and I said, hey, you know, what's the next step? And he didn't, <laughs> he just texted me Joe Niebuhr's phone number, the owner of Contender Boats and said, call Joe. It's a done deal. I got Joe on the phone and Joe said, hey, I'm, I'm going on vacation uh, next Wednesday. Uh, Rick Murphy loves you. Uh, I called the marina here locally in Sarasota and talked to my dealer there, and they love you. And I didn't even know who Erickson Marine was at the time, but it was Erickson Marine. And he said, and then I went online, and I see you're offshore and inshore. Now I love you. Get down here before I go on vacation. I want this deal done. And I went down there and had a meeting with Joe on a Tuesday morning, and by lunchtime, I was headed back home and my deal was done and, and Real Animals presented by Contender Boats was born. So it was, it's just kind of crazy the way it all, <laughs> it all just. And that's how long have you been with Contender now, brother? Five, well, five years. I'm going into my sixth year. Six years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So for those yeah. inter interested in such um, nowadays, because you know, the economy and stuff has changed and it's just a whole different world than what you and I are used to. Um, if somebody is looking to secure sponsors, what's, what's the best way for them to go about such and what, what credentials do they really need to bring before you know they what? start approaching? You know what? I think it's, I think what's being lost in today's society and in today's corporate world, and it's really sad. Because when all this is done, when all the when all the Captain Mike's and the Dave Lashier, when we're all gone, C.A. Richardson's, when we're all gone, and nobody understands what relationships are all about, it's going to be a sad place. It's going to be a sad marketplace. I, I agree. I've had and conversations was, with with others true. when you ask them what's the purpose of a business, and the first words out of their mouth is to make money. I go, No, you're wrong. The purpose of a business is to acquire and maintain customers. You do that correctly, you'll make money. Well, and, and it's it's about, <clears throat> I had this conversation with uh, one of my good friends at Strike King, Doug Miner. And you know, Doug's an older gentleman, been, been with the company for years. And he said, he's like, Mike, we're a dying breed, bro. I don't need to babysit you. I don't need... I don't need little reports. I don't need all that nonsense that the kids today, the young CEOs, the young corporate managers want because they were taught by a guy with a gray long ponytail three quarters of the way down his back who smokes pot every day. Calls and never did a, a dang thing in his life. Calls, his, right, calls himself a professor and never worked a day in his life. He doesn't have any idea what the relationships do. And like he said, you and I have a relationship. When I send you an email and say, Mike, I need you to do this, I don't think about it again. I know it'll get done because we have a relationship. If you email me, you don't have to check on me because if you need it, I'll get it done. And that's that's the difference. And I think that's what the young 
captains, the young tournament, saltwater tournament anglers are missing. It's about relationships. It really is. I mean, it's not about, look at my resume, look how many charters I take. It's not about that. It's about getting in with people and understanding them and knowing them. You know, my relationship with Jim Nassa, the pro Marine, my relationship with Joe Niebuhr and the, and the great staff at Contender Boats, Jim Fillion, Julian McLean, Neil Ross with Gill's Apparel, um, you know, uh, Connor Hughes with, with Penn, Connor Megan at Yamaha, you know, John Oliverio at Power. I mean, the list is long. Uh, yeah, Mike Benestoni at Maui Jim. I mean, there's these are all people that I've been working with, working for. Jim Bickle at Gator Jim. I mean, the list is great. Mike Mahoney at Team Mahoney Company. These are all relationships. And at some point in these relationships, they've needed me to do something for them. And you have to be able to do that. You have to want to do that. Um, you know, working with the tackle, some of the tackle guys, you know, um, uh, uh, Charlie Reynolds is a rep. And, and, and I've said this before. Um, I love, I love working. Chris Dawson is our rep at Bull Bay Rods. Great rep. And I love working and helping guys like that make their money because they're good people. Um, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I've always said that if I had to do this and, and I'm, if, if I was working for like partners and I call them partners, not sponsors, because in reality, that's what they are. They're oh, they are. You're growing their brand and they're helping you grow yours. It's a, it's exactly. a collaboration. And I think if, if I'm working and I've done it, I've had sponsors only for a year, usually where halfway through the year, I'm like, you know what? I don't like you people like your products. Okay. But all you people in the office, you're just not great people. You're just the owner of the company is just an ass. Pardon my French. And then if the shoe fits, I'm, brother, I'm just saying at the end of the at the end of the year, I'm like, you know, I don't want to do that again. And I know there's money attached to it, but I'd rather go to work in that particular category for a company. You know, uh, Bob's Machine Shop. I mean, all these people that oh, they're you know, great. Steve, yeah, Steve Pellini over there. They're just great people. We're friends on Facebook. I care about their kids and their families. I want to do well. I want to sell Bob's Machine Shop jack plates to help them out. Dan Gallagher at Rolls Axel. I want to sell Rolls Axel trailers so it helps my friend Dan Gallagher. That's that's what it's about to me. I mean, and yes, those It's the relationships. Should, I agree. I mean, I was just talking to Steve and myself the other day I mean, it's just great people to work with and it's what it's it, to me that's what the industry is all about it really it is. is and a lot of the youngsters don't get it they they think because they're a guide and because they ran 220 trips last year by golly somebody owes them something they don't owe you nothing no, they, don't. they don't owe you nothing it's not the way the world works and unfortunately that's just kind of the mess we're in and i think some of the new corporates some of the new ceos they just don't get it they just don't understand that that's not going to work. It's no. just not going to work. No, it's all about the relationships at the end of the day. Yeah, well, for sure. Speaking of which, I know you've been involved with several conservation groups. Um, which ones are you working with nowadays? And what improvements have you seen because of those efforts? I know you and I had this discussion in the past about them opening up sea trout for a recreational take which I, I i didn't agree with that at all and i'm, I'm kind of surprised that it's still in place but which ones are you working with and and, and what improvements well, really have you seen here here's i think here's the issue i think you know I'm, for those people that know me and those people that don't cca for me coastal conservation association is doing a great job especially doing a great job with what they have to work with. If you think about this, in the entire country, there's like 340,000 members of CCA. In the entire country, not in Florida, not in Texas, not in Louisiana, the entire country. And now we have CCA, all, especially it's real heavy, Gulf Coast, East Coast, right. Georgia, the Carolinas, you know, there's chapters of CCA in a lot of those places. And I've said this on the radio show. I've said it on the Florida ICAST. I've said it at every seminar I can think of for the last, ever since I figured it out. You know as well as I do that if you're a gun owner, 
there's a, a contingency of people in this country that do not want you to have your guns. No. And if they could take them, they would take them. You know why they don't take your guns? Because the politicians know that there's six million members of the NRA. That's just members of the NRA. That's right. That's just guaranteed six million gun owners. Now, you and I and everybody else out there that's educated at all knows that there's way more than six million guns on the streets. Oh, this is true. And I think one time I, I saw a report where just the deer hunters in the United States alone was like the third largest armed army on the planet. For sure. 100%. That, that's, people really need to, to equate that. 100%. So I, I've said it before. The reason that the conservation efforts by some of these groups don't work is because the recreational anglers as a whole, charter captains included, are, are just, we're just lazy. We not do not united. get involved. We stand on the dock and bitch and piss and moan about all the issues going on in our waterways. And we don't like the CCA did this and, you know, Captain for Clean Water did this and blah, 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 blah. Shut up and put your money where your mouth is and get involved. And again, I, I was guilty. I was super busy. And I was getting an invite to the CCA banquet here in Tampa every year. Well, if you get an invite to sit at a table, you get a free membership. So I'm on the radio barking that everybody should be involved and I wasn't even spending my own money. Well, I fixed that because I came home one day and said, you know what? I can't do that. I can't do this like that. I have to be, I want to be a life member. So I wrote a check. I wrote a thousand dollar check to be a life member of CCA. And it's my biggest soapbox. And it's because of the diversity of the things they work on. And I know some people, especially those people that have a, a big love affair with Captains for Clean Water, which I also do. I love Captains for Clean Water. I wrote them a very big check when Chris Whitman and Daniel came to Tampa to be on my radio show because I believe in what they're doing. What I don't believe in is I don't believe in those two groups doing battle. And for some reason, there's a rift. No, it needs to be a top. common cause. There's a rift, right. There's a rift there at the top of the organizations. And I don't know. You know, CCA will tell you it's it's captains and captains will tell you it's CCA. I don't really care whose fault it is. It's asinine and it's ridiculous and it's childish. And Just it's fix the problem. It. It's the problem we have with all our politics. Right. We, we're all clean water is nothing. Anyone who's fighting for clean water, I'm in. I'm in. I get it. And anyone that's fighting for oyster beds and, and helping Blair Wiggins with his clam restoration project over there in Mosquito Lagoon, just like CCA is. They're doing that redfish restocking with Duke Energy. I mean, all of the things that CCA Florida, CCA National does for our fishery, how anyone, Captains for Clean Water included, could take a shot at them makes no sense to me. Zero sense. It's not helping anything. Um, with that being said, we need people to be involved. We need a bigger voice. If there was 3 million, if there was 3 million members of CCA Florida or CCA National, and our lobbyists went to the floor with issues, you'd have the politicians' ears. You're not getting their ears with 300,000 people. They don't, no. They're not noticing it. They don't care. It's that simple. And it drives me nuts for as cheap as it is to do it. And they, they, they go out, you know, Texas was doing a great job of the CCA Star Tournament uh, concept. Brian Gorski, Lisa Fitzgerald, the great people at CCA Florida bring that concept here and it's so much fun. And it's so easy. I talk about it on the radio show all the time. It's like 101 days of fishing over the summer. And multiple species, offshore, inshore, tarpon, there's all these species in this thing. Costs you little to nothing to get in. I think it's 75 bucks or 80 bucks total if you're for your membership plus your entry fee into CCR, uh, CCA Florida Star Tournament. I had a guy on my, on my boat that was fishing a charter with his wife and his son. He won a boat. They're not cheap. Boat. They're not cheap, brother. He won a boat. I mean, I'm like, I was totally freaked out. I showed up at the star banquet. Here's this family waiting to get on the trolley to go to the banquet from the hotel that we were all staying at. And 
I'm like, what are you doing here? And he goes, remember that speck? We were catching redfish one after another out of this big school. And he catches like a 23 inch trout out of the middle of this school of redfish. And he goes, hey, uh, do you mind if I put this in the CCA star tournament? I don't have a trout registered yet. And I laughed. I'm like, of course I don't mind. That's awesome. Go ahead. He won a boat. Amazing. Dude won a boat. You know, I know Jerry Bergeron, who won the very first truck that they gave away. He signed up at my outdoor expo at the Tampa fairgrounds, at the Florida State Fairgrounds. I'm sorry, here in Tampa. And I mean, there's winners. People actually win stuff all the time. And you're going to go fishing all summer anyway. All my listeners on the radio, people who watch the TV shows, they watch CA, they watch me, they watch Murph, they watch Blair, you know. They watch the Sea Hunter. They watch George Gods. They're all ate up with fishing. You're going to fish all summer anyway. You're going to the Keys. You're going everywhere. Why wouldn't you get involved in CCA and take advantage of all the stuff that they're giving away? For less no than sense. the cost of a decent dinner. Makes no sense to me. No, it's, it's not logical. Sense. It's not on. logical at all. No. And you and I have talked about this in the past. I just don't think people realize how big recreational fishing when it comes to dollars and cents is here in the state of Florida alone. Yeah. I mean, we should be able to get just about anything accomplished because of the, uh, I mean, billions of dollars it is. It's getting to be, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, for sure. And again, that, you know, if you add all that up and you could tell the politicians, man, I got, and there should be, listen, it's totally ridiculous that there isn't, 3 million members of CCA Florida. It's ridiculous. Too many people living on the coast here that we should have 3 million members of CCA Florida. Just their you, efforts on the net ban alone. You and I both remember that battle. Of course. Of course. Well, and, 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 and part of that, you know, we get a little pushback from the commercial guys that are still pissed at CCA because CCA made such a big push for it. But if you're, and again, the bad part about that was, you know, there's good commercial guys that there didn't is. drop that didn't drop their nets on, in front of creeks in February that they knew were choked full of, of redfish and trout. There were guys that only struck mullet and had very little collateral damage in the fishery. There was guys who did it, commercial guys who did it the right way, and there was commercial guys who didn't. And unfortunately, the commercial guys who didn't beat up the process and those guys who were doing it by the book and correctly and uh you know with good conservation in mind they lost on that deal so i understand and i have a lot of friends who commercial mullet fish and i get it i totally understand the bitterness to that side that being said the fishing's better it just is the fishing's better because of the net net. well you can't wipe out your nursery and expect to have any fish left no it's not gonna work like that it's not gonna work now our, our battle is water quality, and we've, yes. we've got to get that straightened out. It's just because you can enact all the regulations and stuff that you want to, and you can shut things down, but all it takes is a, is a super big red tide event or some other, like we have coming down the Clusahatchee that just kicks off that mess. And it's all for naught. It's all for naught. I mean, years worth of time and effort for nothing when everything yes. just burns up and dies off just makes a mess out of everything yeah it's very it's just really really it's just really sad it is it just is is. just it's a little bit heartbreaking the whole concept of it and again i you know i can rattle tat tat on some conservation chatter all day just because it you know it, it it's done so much for my family these estuaries are so important um and again, my hat's off to, to CCA as an organization for doing so many great things. You know, with so little. Work, yeah, with so little. And they work with so many great organizations. Tampa Bay Watch, you know, working on seagrass right here in my backyard. They do, you know, they're dropping these giant concrete, you know, uh, uh, pyramids all over offshore, making artificial reefs, you know, uh, replacing ones that are getting deteriorated because of time. Um, you know, there's just a lot of great things that CCA does for, and again, people are busy. I get it. I don't have time to go to Tallahassee. I wish I did because 
you know, at 6'5", 270 pounds, I could probably scare some politicians into making the right decision. No, you don't yeah. want to go to Tallahassee, brother. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be <laughs> in jail. You'd too. be in jail. <laughs> I know, I know. But, but when I, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm glad that they go, and I'm glad they do what they do. And for me to pay, you know, 35, 40 bucks a year membership dues for them to do that for me, to me, just seems like a no-brainer. Well, the return on investment is just phenomenal. Yes, for sure. 100%. Okay, so now we've beat up all the politics, and and we're right again. <laughs> Let, let's get over to fishing. Okay. Let's talk gear. Okay. Talk to me about what brands of tackle are you using and, and, and sponsored by, and how have you seen that gear improve over the years? Uh, well, let's start with Bull Bay Rods for sure. Um, and – to give you some background, Kelly Phillips, the guy that started Bull Bay Rods, was was wearing me out trying to get me to come on board. And I was I was in a contract with a company. Um, I was having issues with. Perfect example of me telling you halfway through the year, I'm like, you know what? I just don't even like you people. I was breaking rods, and um, it was just it was just a mess. Um, so I knew I was going to make a change at the end of the year, and. <clears throat> Kelly came up to me and he was like, listen, I know we're small, but I want you to take two of these rods and just try. It. Let me know what you think. Give me your feedback. So really cold day, miserable. I told the guy, it's like, listen, we need to cancel. The guy's like, hey, I took the day off. We can't cancel. I want to go. Okay. So it's blowing 30, cold as hell out. I'm fishing with shrimp. We're catching some trout and small snook and some residential canals trying to hide from the wind. And the boys are, two guys are off the front of my boat. And I grabbed one of the prototypes that Kelly had handed me. I threw a shrimp on it and I pitched it out the back of the boat under the dock. And Dave, I could feel the shrimp moving in the water. You know how shrimp kind of kick? They do. And kick? You could feel it. I knew exactly what that shrimp was doing. And the minute I felt it, I thought, <laughs> uh-oh. Um, that's intriguing. That's that tactile feeling, feel is worth that's a lot. A feeling I have never felt before. These guys are onto something with this blank. Something's up here. So I played with it throughout the day and was just amazed. I got off the water. I got my truck. And I was headed home and I, I called Kelly and I said, "Hey, buddy, um, I don't want you to sponsor me." And he's like, "Oh, uh, did you not like the gear? Or what?" I said, "No, no, no, no. The gear's pretty good." I want to buy in. I want a piece of the action before you before you get too big. Because I don't know what you did to that blank, but that's the most sensitive blank I've ever used. And then as Kelly was walking me through the process of kind of getting to where, you know, he got, it was over a couple of years playing with different blanks. Kelly Phillips was a kayak fisherman who had won a IFA kayak championship. And as you know, most kayak anglers know you do a lot of high sticking in a kayak. And he was just having issues with every brand of rod he could buy was blowing up on him and he hated it. So he started building his own. And then he was still having some problems with some blanks he was buying. And finally he decided, I got to build my own blank. I need to build my own blank. That's not going to blow up. This is what Necessity I want Necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> you bet. So he dove in and came up with this particular blank this system of building blanks and it has just taken off. We're in 200, 250 stores right now, uh, West Marine. Uh, we had our best year ever last year. Last year we were with the Banshee series was uh, best in show at ICAST in the saltwater rod category. Uh, so that, you know, that to me, you know, the offshore stuff we use guys like Jim Nassett, one of the, you know, best, Kingfish teams in the country, they use all of our blanks. Dylan Hubbard at Hubbard's Marina uses all of our blanks. Um, some great fishermen, Ozzy Fisher, Jamie Goodwin, Rick Gross, you know, they're all Bull Bay pro staffers and love the rods. Um, and we don't have a giveaway program. We have a, we have a pro staff program where you buy at the same price that the dealers pay for the rods. Right. That way we don't we, that way we don't upset any of our dealers giving guys free rods or whatever. Um, so they're not super cheap. Um, you know, you, they could get cheaper rods, but you know what we offer in warranty, what they offer in 
you know, quality to put in their customers' hands is, has been outweighing all that. So we're pretty blessed there. Um, I was a quantum guy for years. Quantum has just recently went through some issues. Um, I was a big believer in the quantum product, enjoyed my time over there. I remember that. As, as they went away, um, it was just kind of a sad situation that the company wasn't doing well. And um, I ended up back at Penn at Pure Fishing. And uh, to tell you the truth, I, I, I couldn't be happier with where I'm at. Um, they make a new reel now, the Penn Battle DX3. Uh, silver and black. So it matches my real animal signature series real well. They were 130 bucks at Gator Gyms. And I just picked one up one day when I was in there and I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to buy this from you, buddy. I want to try this. And I have absolutely loved them on my charters. They're holding up well. And what it does is it offers me a reel that I can offer to people that isn't $200 or $220. You know, it's a very high quality reel in that $130 price point, which is a lot more affordable for people. Um, and again, it's still an expensive reel. Don't get me wrong. Um, but good, I believe good whiskey costs money. If you get too cheap a reel, they're just not going to hold up. No, they're just going to implode. Yeah. Yeah. So especially with all the fishing that I do, that's the part I was really impressed about. I used a, a, a full set. I used four pen battle DX threes for a full year last year and never lost one. And that's a lot and of hours, but most people don't realize yeah. Captain Mike is on the water a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And with, if you mix in the filming and, you know, we, we, we battled some big fish on those battle DXs and they held up. So I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of the Spiderwire Ultracast Invisibrade. I have been a Spiderwire guy for many years. Um, I was a fan of theirs and then I got paid for a couple of years and then they took my money away and I just stayed. I didn't go find a new line sponsor because I really like the Spiderwire. Um, it's a line that I'm comfortable with. First braid I, I ever used with Spiderwire. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, um, you know, that kind of covers me on the rods, reels, line side of it. Um, lures, I mean, there's two companies that I ride with and I've been riding with them forever. I think Mirror Lure is as good a saltwater brand as there is on the planet. They are. Um, Eric Bachnick is a great human being. He's constantly designing new baits and everything he comes out with just works. It's just phenomenal. Um, hard baits, soft baits, it doesn't matter. I love the marshmallow. I love the little John. I love the provoker, especially, you know, in the winter time when you're working shallow water, uh, rigged weedless so that you're, you know, working some of those shallows for those big gator trout. It's a great bait. Obviously the Miradine, she dog and top dog and all that stuff. The top water baits are phenomenal. Um, they make a great mirror lure 25 plus diving plug that catches the heck out of grouper when you're trolling. Um, Strike King, Strike King saltwater line is not huge. Um, I wish they would add some things to it. I'm being told that they are going to. What I will tell you is that the Strike King saltwater lures that they currently make, that they work really well. Um, they have some freshwater lures that I throw in saltwater. The uh, KVD Swimming Caffeine Shad is a paddle tail that Kevin Van Dam came up with. And I remember I was sitting at my very first meeting with Strike King. We were waiting on one of the other reps to join the meeting and Doug Miner was sitting at the table, Billy, Captain Billy Nobles was with me and I'm thumbing through the catalog. And the minute I saw that bait, Dave, I looked right at, I looked right at Doug Miner. I looked right at Billy. I pointed at that bait and I said, I am going to catch their keister on that bad boy right there. I guarantee you that is a sexy bait. I need to get my hands on that. And well, Doug flash fishing of, really for all practical purposes is bass fishing with tides. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Doug, a lot Doug of that gear, of, I have a box full of gear that I've used that was originally designed for freshwater because the size, the profile, the vibration, it works. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. The, no doubt. The and, colors and, are natural looking. And the, you know me, I don't fish on the dark side. I don't use right. that. I don't use a natural bait, which is the politically correct term for live bait. I don't cheat that way. I use all artificial. So there is a lot of that out there that really, it, it just works. It just yeah. works. I totally agree. And, and the sad part is the, the freshwater guy crosses over really well. He'll grab a saltwater bait and try it in freshwater. The saltwater guy, for some reason, avoids the freshwater section. I don't know why. Not everybody, but a majority. And I don't know why. It's so like a horse of blinders on for, in those, a lot of cases. I don't know what the deal is, but those baits cross over really, really well. Really well. So... You know, on the apparel side, 
you know, the, the, the stuff they're doing at Gills now is, especially now, they, they hired a guy at, at Gills Apparel, Gills Gear, to, they hired a guy from Under Armour, uh, Julian McLean is his name, as their head designer. And the stuff that he just broke, I just got a box yesterday. The stuff that he just, I mean, and I'm a huge, I'm a big time gym rat. I'm, I'm in the gym just about every day. And I was going to ask so you I'm about a, that. I'm an Under Armour guy. Um, my wife will tell you, I got way too many Under Armour t-shirts and sweatshirts and this, that, and the other. I'm a huge Under Armour fan. And the minute I put on the new gear, I looked right at Julian and I said, dude, this gear here is gear that I'd wear on the boat and to the gym. It's that comfortable. It's unbelievable. The fit, um, the styles, I was just blown away. Um, the material changed. We had good material before, uh, but Julian kind of took this thing, the whole gills thing to another level. Um, so that's really interesting to me. Fish monkey gloves is another company I've been working with that I really believe in, you know, um, 30 years of fishing now, you know, pretty hardcore and, and never, you know, always wearing sunscreen, but never really thinking about my hands. You're in and out of the live well all day long. You're releasing fish that salt water just takes that protection right off your hands and your hands are getting cooked. You know, you're not, you're not rinsing your face with water. You're not rinsing the back of your neck or your ears with water to wash that sunscreen off, but your hands, you're rinsing them all day in the salt water environment. So, um, Tim Mossberg, who used to be with Mojo Apparel, uh, that's how I met Tim. When he started Fish Monkey, he gave me a call, and boy, what a great, great tool that is. Makes Has made a huge difference. And I go see my dermatologist every year, and the amount of stuff I have to have, you know, cut off my hands every year, stuff that he or she looks at that they're not that pleased with has almost gone away because long sleeve gills, shirts, uh, you know, sun protection there. And then with the fish monkey gloves, it's, it's really made a big difference. Plus all, you, you lose a lot of the cuts and scrapes that you get in a saltwater environment anyway. So your hands just feel better, which is a nice thing as well. Well, this is true. I've always worn half finger gloves because I may make three, four or 500 casts in a day. So my hands are parallel to the sun. Sure. And when my son, you know, when the sun just burns my hands, party's over, I'm done. Right. The rest of me For can sure. be cooked. And I can turn that nice shade of red, thanks to my, you know, Native American background. So I turn a nice shade of maroon. But when my hands are cooked, party's over with. I'm done. Yeah. I, yeah. So I've always, I've been a big fan of those, of half finger gloves. I just think that they're, they just make a huge difference. You know, I don't wear sunscreen. Uh, I wear it. I wear it in my clothing, which I think works just so much better because it doesn't block up the pores. You're not sure. dealing with the yeah. with the heat process. So I, I, you and I have even fought over a, a shirt one time. I still have it. It was an Orvis shirt, and uh, you know it's just amazing how a quality materials can make a difference in your day fishing and staying cool and being productive for sure. It makes it makes a huge difference. Talk to really me about sunglasses. You're still working with and sponsored by Maui Jim, if I'm not mistaken. I have been a Maui Jim guy for years. Um, and, and to tell you the truth, um, it, 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 especially through COVID, uh, they were one of the companies because they're on every continent. They're a company that took a real beat down. Um, you know, across the U S and our platform, the outdoor outdoor market has done really well yep, Boats, exploded fishing tackle yeah i mean companies can't even keep up but for maui gym a lot of that stuff that they were they, they do a lot of business here but they do a lot of business overseas you know australia all these places well COVID obviously hit all those places and, and messed up some of those places real bad so you know they there was a point there where they were like listen we just we can't support you quite the same way we've been supporting you um and, and most guys would jump ship because there's other brands. You could go do something else. Maui Jim makes the best pair of sunglasses on the planet, period. They do things to their lenses that no other company does. It's real simple. It's, it's all in the patents. There's a ton of them. It's stuff you can look up. Um, they, they have the best, bar none, the best warranty of any company I play with. And I play with companies that have great warranties. And... My wife had a pair of glasses, true story. She had a pair of glasses for like 
Dave, I want to say she had him for five or six years. Yeah. Just this pair of, you know, love. She loved these glasses. She breaks them. And I said, babe, I got, you know, six or eight gift certificates in the office up by the desk. They're just order a new pair. She's like, mm, I'm going to call them. I really like this pair. It was $10 to get them fixed and sent back. 10 bucks. And she broke them. It wasn't a defect. It wasn't an issue with that. Right. It wasn't defect in material workmanship. It was well, 10 bucks, 10 bucks to fix them. Once you're a Maui Jim customer, they want you to stay Maui Jim. And I just, I haven't found a lens that does for me what that lens does. Now I'm not saying that some of the other companies don't have good lenses because they do. But when you add in the, the warranty, the quality, the relationship, again, Mike Battistoni, I've been there 15 years. You know, I just, I just can't walk away from that. Are you using a different lens when you're fishing the flats versus fishing near or offshore? Or I almost just... always, I almost always wear the same lens. I like their HCL bronze lens uh, a lot for shallow water. Um, they've recently come out with a couple of other lenses. They've never had a mirrored lens before. Now they do a blue mirror um, on some of their styles, which is very weird for uh, Maui because they don't like to do anything to the lens that will distort clarity. Uh, and I've heard a lot of bitching and complaining over the years. Well, I would go Maui, but I like the mirrored lens. I like the mirrored lens. I like the mirrored lens. So that's why they do Costa or whatever. Um, well, and that's why Maui was finally like, okay, here's, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it our way. Um, and, and then they have a Manchester United pair that's kind of a red mirror that, uh, that I like as well. Um, and I don't notice a huge difference shallow or offshore in, in the quality of what I'm seeing. Um, if I was fishing a redfish tournament for money, I would wear HCL bronze, which, you know, I have several pairs. So just flipping from one pair to the other is easy. Um, and if you were going to buy one pair of glasses and you're listening to this, I would tell you to find the frame you like, and I would tell you to order it in HCL bronze. If you're an inshore guy, that's the lens to have. Period. And it doesn't matter to you if that's low light or noon. Well, they make, and they make a low light lens now too. Um, that's really interesting again, but Maui Jim makes an expensive pair of glasses. Can you afford multiple pairs? If you can, then I would get a gray pair, an HCL bronze, and then I'd get their low light version as well, because on a cloudy day, it pulls light in and it really pops. Um, so that would be a bonus too. And again, I've been with the company a long time. I've got all those versions at my disposal. But if I had one pair of glasses to put on every morning to go fish, period, it, it would be something with an HCL bronze lens. I think that's our best lens overall for fishing. Well, I agree. You know, I, my discussion with Captain Travis over in the Bahamas, so we were talking about fly fishing. You and I both know fly fishing can get exorbitant when it comes to rods and reels and line and i don't think it necessarily has to be but it they can so being able to keep everybody to be able to get something that's quality and it works and it's not a deal breaker i think is 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 critical in this market yeah for sure no doubt makes a big difference good stuff's got to work so all the time that you spend on the water both guiding and fishing tournaments what is the biggest mistake that you see people making? Patience. Lack of patience. 100%. 100% easy question to answer. It's a lack of patience. And I've said for years, I understand it. You're in your office. You're in your truck. You're on the job site all week long, grinding, thinking about getting on the water and getting on that school of redfish. And when you get there and you see a school of redfish, that's when you need to take a breath. Slow down. You found them. You're on the flat. Where well, that's are. the hardest thing is finding the fish. You're on the beach where all the tarpon are. You're, you know, slow down. Slow down. I have an old saying. Fish do not, at least to my knowledge, I've been doing this a long time, they do not eat out their butt. Okay. You have to present the baits properly. And in order to do that, you need to take your time. If you spook them and then chase them, that party is over. It's over. Oh, very quickly. I don't know how many times I've had people on the boat and I keep telling them, like, look, the prey does not chase the predator. Right. 
Presentation is the key. It's everything. It's everything. It's a simple game. You've got to do it right. You just, um, you just, you, you have to get that presentation correct. I've been on the beach many times, looked at my customers and went, watch this. Those two boats are chasing them tarpon and they're coming right at us. Watch. Pitch a crab out right in that line. And the look on those faces of those people on the mother boats are like, we've been chasing those fish for three miles. How come they just ate for him? Because you didn't present the baits right. That's right. I'm looking at the captain. They're like grumpy with me. I'm like, dude, you're an idiot. You don't even belong doing this. They don't eat out their ass, dude. You're chasing them down the beach. No, you can't they do that. Don't. Can't do, they can't, don't. Do with, can't do with redfish either. They're not going to eat out their butt. You got to present that bait so they swim into it. And that's across the board. That's the biggest mistake people make. Is just they're just not patient. You got to be patient. Just Somebody's don't understand the predator prey relationship. I think mm-hmm. is is a big part of it. That's some for days sure. are going to be good. Some days are going to be bad. That's just the way the game is played. You know, that's why it's called fishing. Really, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. Let's talk boats. Now you've been with contender for a while. What do you feel is some of its strong suits and give me a couple of weak points because you and I both know there's no such thing as a perfect boat, but what do you like about running the contender versus what you've ran in the past? Well, I think, I think you hit the nail right on the head. There's no perfect boat. Like if you're in a perfect world, if you're going to, if you're going to fish tournaments or, you know, if I was going to go back on the tournament scene, I'd want two boats. I need a bay boat, like my contender 25. And then I'd need a skinny water boat, you know, like a Chittum or maybe even one of the Texas style boats or something. I don't know. But I mean, that's, you know, there's, in my opinion, for what I do, there's, n- there's no limitations in the Contender 25 Bay. That's what I love about the boat. Um, and I tell people, if you look at the 25 Contender Bay, you may not like the layout. You might look in it and go, eh, I don't really like the way this is laid out. And I get that because all boats are laid out different and everybody's tastes are different. But if you want a boat that is the best riding bay boat I've ever been in, in choppy, nasty stuff, If you want the driest bay boat I've ever been in that floats relatively skinny for a 25 foot bay that I can stretch offshore for kingfish and, you know, run across from one side of Tampa Bay to the other and, you know, two to threes. It's the the bottom of that hole. Joe Niebuhr has it figured out, period. It's soft. It's dry. It's unbelievable. I can't tell you how many times my customers when I tell them, hey, it's going to be a little bumpy running across today, but that's where my fish are. We need to run across. And you make that run. They sit down the whole run. Don't even stand up. And then when you get across, they look at you and go, that's unbelievable, dude. That's unbelievable. I've been in the boat filming with pros from other companies that have looked at me and went, I don't know how to say this, but this boat runs better than mine. I thought mine was the best. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. I've been a lot of different companies. I was Action Craft. I've been Dorado, Yellowfin, Skeeter, Century, when Century was doing bay boats. And the 25 Contender Bay is hands down, far and away, the best riding bay boat I've ever been in. Now, inside, yeah, if I could, get in Joe's ear, I'd make a few changes. But nothing that, to me, is, is a major issue. Uh, the boat does just about everything well. Um, I just like it. I really do. Um, so, well, I know you loaded down with natural bait. You've oh, got cameraman sure. on there. You've got, um, do you, I don't think you have a tower on it, but you do have a, I do. A t- I do have, I do have a you tower. Have a tower. Yep. T-tower, yeah. Um, and you're running a big Yamaha on her. What is she drafting when you have her loaded full of fuel? And it's a true, it's a true 14 inch boat. You'll see people that advertise their bay boats as 14s that, really need 17 this one's a true 14 15 inch boat if you're full of fuel four guys a charter captain live wells are full it's a true 14 15 inch boat just is. what about the hull does it I, i've been on no, some in the past not. that just popped and cracked and i asked no. one guy one time i said have you ever caught a snook off this thing because it makes so much noise we might as well be pitching grenades out here 
No, and what I what I worry about more than the creeks inside the boat is I worry more about hull slap. Right. And we don't get a lot of hull slap either. And that's to me is a big benefit. Because our so you don't have water too. splashing up against a hard chine making a pop, 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 pop no, noise all the time. No, 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 no. And if it, you know, for if it's really, really blowing, if it's blowing 25, oh, it's going to it doesn't matter what it is. Right, exactly. Then you're gonna have some of that. I mean, I've seen I've seen Mavericks and everything else though. You know, when you get in those kind of conditions, it's gonna make noise. You just it's, it's simple hydrodynamics at that point. It's gonna it's gonna have that type of issue. Yep. So now you've been running these Maver uh, the the contender now uh, with the Yamaha. Is that a factory installed engine for them? Is that what they're what they're only putting on, or can do they offer other engine when, manufacturers? When I, when I first started with them at my very first meeting, uh, Joe Niebuhr said, "You're Yamaha." I said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "Okay, good. Stay there because if not, it's a deal breaker." They are very, very aligned with Yamaha. With that being said, I've seen more contenders roll out recently with Mercury's or other brands on them than I ever had before. And that's due just to their ability to sometimes get the Yamaha's. Supply every demand. Motor, every, motor, every motor company's having that issue. So if he happens to get his hand on a Mercury and the customer will take it, he's delivering that boat. But I can tell you that Joe Niebuhr, as the owner of Contender Boats, when he his big boats, his bay boat, they're all powered by Yamaha. Again, all those hours and days that you've spent on the water, if somebody is looking to upgrade their current skiff or boat, and, and they have a budget that they're trying to work within like we all do, uh, what do you feel is the best upgrade path for them let's say fishing the flats uh, you feel a power pole or a trolling motor or, or maybe is there something else that you've seen and worked with that would add good success for them you know return on investment yeah I, I don't know that there's i don't know there's 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 three things that i wouldn't want to live without and there's all three of them are made by the same company now you can't get your hands on part of it yet but it's coming um and that's power pole on the back end to me is a no brainer, especially if you're a skinny water guy. Always had one, water. always will. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I highly recommend two if you can afford it. It, it one works great, two is ridiculous, mind blowing. Um, there's also, to me, it's also important that my boat stays charged while I'm running. I'm running you know, two pumps, maybe a stereo running electronics, upper station, lower station. I want to make sure that that my batteries stay charged so we can get home. The power pole charge is a phenomenal new tool. It's an actual charge on the run system. It actually charges your batteries as you're running. So a lot of times for me, I'll run across the bay from, from St. Pete and I'll fish, you know, uh, the Manatee River or the Little Manatee River, Joe's Island, Bishop's Harbor, Cockroach Bay, whatever, um, maybe down out in front of Anna Maria during tarpon season. Well, when I run home, the run from that far to back to my marina, I'm fully charged by the time I hit the marina. Now, I still plug it in because I'm just that overprotective guy. We're old school. It's a lot of A lot of guys don't. A lot of the tournament guys now that are using it, they make a long run home, fully charged. You can look at the app on your phone. Okay, all of my batteries are fully charged. I know they're running again next morning. You know, the bass guys are running up and early and at it. They know that they got to make a long run in the morning. So they're going to, whatever they lose overnight is going to reboot and, and they don't have to do it. So the power pole charge is a really neat system that I think is game changing. And then obviously what hasn't broke yet fully is the power pole trolling motor. It's done. They're ready to launch, but they're having supply issues, just like everybody else. And John Oliverio will not launch it until his supplies are at a sufficient amount that he can deal with any problems that may come up. He doesn't want people ordering them and not be able to get them for six months and all this other stuff. So I'm told by later, you know, October, November 2022, I should have one on my boat. Now I've seen it. 
I've seen it on some guys' boats, testing, all that stuff. Um, I just did a recent podcast with John Oliverio as well, and and it's it's ready to go. They're just they're just waiting on some parts to kind of finish it off. So those three things, a really good trolling motor, power pole to me is a no brainer. And then making sure that I can stay charged all day, running the tools I need to on my boat and, and, and you're in pretty good shape. Are you running a jack plate on your contender? Well, that's another piece. I, I should have said that too. I, I go in my brain, think nobody, and I should have mentioned that because the Bob's machine jack plate, I don't think there's another jack plate on the market. And if there is, I wouldn't use it. I had one time in my career, a boat came to me delivered from a company I was with, with another brand on it. And for the entire year that I was stuck with that boat, I hated my jackpot. And I've only happened to me once and I'll never do it again. The rest of the time I've been a Bob's machine shop jackpot. There's nothing that works like it. Um, you know, it's a local American made company. It's just, just great people over there. Uh, Bob, when he invented that thing, he changed the game for shallow water fishing. God, that came one for a long time. Yeah, that came first. That came before the power poles and all that nonsense was was the, you know, jack plate came first. And he really made it possible for guys to get way up skinny, uh, you know, years and years ago. And it's just constantly evolving. Uh, Steve Pellini and his dad over there do a great job. So, um, and yeah, I should have mentioned that too. I would never, I tell people that all the time. Don't buy a boat without a jack plate. Don't buy a little bay boat without a jack. Make sure. And that's probably the one tool you can anchor. It's just more of a pain in the butt. Okay. They sell other brands of chargers. You know, you can put a charge in your boat and keep it battery charged. If, you know, if that's what you want to do. The one thing I would say that I would say your, your, your jack plate is a must have because you got to be able to get skinny. Number one, number two, you got to have a trolling motor, especially in an area like Tampa Bay. Um, almost now anywhere in Florida because there's so much fishing pressure coming in quiet is the key to you catching fish. So having a trolling motor that can do, you know, I always say, let the wind blow you in wherever you're headed, get that wind at your back and let it blow you in if possible. And then just use your trolling motor a little bit to guide you to the spots you want to fish. The less you're on your trolling motor, the better, but that's a very essential tool in trying to catch fish in, in the shallow waters we deal with today. Well, I think the one aspect that a lot of people seem to either negate or forget when they're looking at putting a jack plate on their boat is the fuel savings that they're going to get once they learn how to operate it. Because it's just not to get the boat launched. It's also raising the engine up while you're running. Those types of things. I used to have a, uh, and I still do, I do on the, on the newer one, but a fuel burn gauge, just bringing that engine up while you're running makes a huge difference in fuel consumption. So it will eventually pay for itself. May take, may take some time, but fuel has gone insane here lately again. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, yeah. yeah any, any little bit that we can do to help that's a no brainer. What electronics are you now running? I'm Ray Marine. Uh, I've been Ray Marine for several years now. I'm a big fan of the, uh, of that platform. Uh, there's a lot of good electronics on the market right now. So I tell people, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, um, you know, a lot of these companies do great things, the side imaging and the down imaging and all the, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's just crazy what you can see once you learn how to work, whatever brand machine it is you like, um, you, you know, it, it's just the world is endless. It's almost unfair to the fish, actually. Well, there is a learning curve. You have to take the time. Of course, I think YouTube University helps quite a bit with that now. You know, you're not forced to sit there and read a book to be able to figure it out. Right. For sure. For what sure. I mean, do you feel has it brought to your game versus some of the other ones that you've run in the past? Is it just more clear, faster? What What do you like the best about it? Well, it, it, Ray Marine has had a reputation in the past of being a, a unit that was tough to use. When Ray Marine first hit the market, it was a little tough to use. It was confusing for me. I'm not a big computer techie guy. So once they fixed all that and they, they evolved into this company that was a lot, where the product was a lot easier to use, um, that, has, that has really helped them get to kind of, you know, where they needed to be as a company. Um, 
you know, they've got some new radar coming out that's supposed to be mind boggling. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't had a chance to play with it, um, but it's supposed to be just unbelievable. So I think, you know, that's, that's kind of a cool thing. That's kind of, kind of hitting the market, you know? Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, the side imaging, the, the things that you can do now with Axiom, the, the 3D sonar imaging that you get at the bottom um, is, is really ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, you know, it's like I said, a part of this to me is almost, you know, it's almost illegal. It should be illegal. <laughs> I mean, it's, I look at my system and I'm like, God, there's just nothing that we can't do with this. And, and it, I mean, it's giving you so much information um, at just the click of a button. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's mind blowing. It really is. I mean, and, and again, it's, I, I'm not sure that it's not a little unfair. I mean, I don't, I don't know how the fish stand in prayer, Dave. I really don't. I mean, with what we can do now, side vision, you know, the, the 3D imaging on the bottom where you're actually being able to map out every inch of the bottom. You can see fish that are suspended. You can map out an entire pass and see where you want to drift through that pass. I mean, there's the tools and toys that they're putting in these machines now are endless. It's crazy. Well, just Crazy. knowing which docks to pitch up under. So you're not For wasting sure. your time pitching it under a dock that has no fish. 100%. 100%. And that's all what about I say. Dogs. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really gotten to be <laughs> ridiculous. How many hours a year are you running on your Yamaha? And I, I'm going to assume that you're getting a, a new contender every year or every other year. Yep. Every year. Yep. Um, I, I probably, I mean, to be truthful, I probably sit at 400 hours maybe, which maybe doesn't sound like that much, but I run most of my trips out of the south end of Tampa Bay. So I don't put on a pile of hours running my boat on the charter side. Um, I just don't. Now, you know, Joe Blow Recreational Angler, he may, you know, 400 hours, it may take him Three five years, years. Five, five years to do that it just depends right. on how much he uses the boat i know some charter captains that'll you know they'll put on with the with the radio shows on the weekends the tv show all the commitments you have with that icast the miami boat show and things like that that just keep you off the water you know i'm probably running still 100 150 days a year it's uh, still a lot of days that. yeah it's still a lot of days i try to run three days a week when possible, there's some weeks where the weather doesn't allow you to do that. And some weeks you got to run four or five days, just depends on who's in town. So, you know, it's just, it's all part of it, but I, that, that, that would be between hundred and 150 days, 150 days a year is kind of what, what I'm on the water now. Do you personally sell your own rig at the end of the year? If somebody yeah. wanted to purchase it from you? Well, my, and, and the boat that I'm in right now, that I'm running daily has been gone since four months before I picked it up. And the boat that I'm picking up here in about a month and a half, two months, my new one is already sold. Already the gone. demand on the market is just amazing these days. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. just insane. Yeah, totally crazy. But, you know, part of the blessings for sure. This is true. It's true. So now yes. if somebody wants to go fishing with you. Mm-hmm. Should they bring their own tackle or do you have pretty much everything rigged down? Yeah, I, I handle all the tackle. I'd rather people not bring tackle. Um, I have all the tackle. Um, I go catch fresh bait in the morning. So I tell people just bring whatever you want to eat or drink, sunscreen up and show up. That's all there is what, to it. What time of year do you feel is best for fishing in that area? I mean, you I know have what? I'm I'm a diehard spring guy. I love when the fish come out of the back country here and put the feed bag on and, you know, especially the snook as they're heading to the beaches and the passes to spawn. They know that it's spawning season and they, they tend to eat really good. We get a phenomenal redfish run in the fall. 
um, September, even though it's really hot still. And, and this past year, even August, August was good. September was good. Uh, October, November were phenomenal uh, for redfish, big schools of redfish. So, um, you know, I tell people all the time, we don't have bad fishing in Florida. We just don't. I mean, year round, the fishing's good. Depends on the weather, you know, and obviously in the wintertime, we have more fronts and stuff like that. So, you know, you lose a few more days in the wintertime than you do the rest Sorry, of the sure. year. But yeah, but, but it's, I mean, we always can catch fish. If I had to tell you, hey, you know, I want to catch... I want a 50 snook day and I want to catch a couple of redfish, maybe a flounder. I would say, let's get you booked for May or June and we'll catch them up. They'll go crazy. So, you know, but there's really not a bad month. I mean, you know, April, excellent month. If it's warm, kingfish are here. You know, there's, there's just, you know, May and June is tarpon season. Uh, we catch mangrove snapper all over Tampa Bay, just really big ones in, you know, July and August. Uh, early September, that snapper bite's phenomenal. Giant sheephead this time of year. Grouper fishing, uh, even though gag grouper season is closed right now, it's phenomenal. Catch and release gag grouper inside Tampa Bay is ridiculous. Uh, so there's just always something to do here, always. If somebody's wanting to go on a charter with you, I'm sure you deal with this quite frequently. What gear items should they bring? And probably more important, what should they not forget to bring well, I mean, you know, I always think it's good to put a poncho, a rain jacket or something in your bag. Again, extra sunscreen, you know, maybe some uh, some some lip sunscreen as well. Um, but, you know, whatever you like to eat or drink and, and just get on the boat. You know, a good charter captain should have water and, and ice on the boat ready for you. Um, I got customers that are like, hey, I'm going to be fishing. I don't eat when I fish. So they don't bring anything to, to munch on, which is cool, too. So, um, you know. Try to stay out of boots. I'd probably say the one thing that gets me the most is my my country boys, my hardworking guys that show up and they're wearing the same boots that they wore on the job site yesterday. Um, no, and that's a little, that's a little tough on the deck from time to time. Yeah, exactly, a little more scrubbing, little more scrubbing we got to do. I got aqua traction in my boat, which uh, is, in my opinion, the best marine flooring on the market, and uh, it cleans up pretty easy. But a little more elbow grease needed if I got you know, black marks from some black sole boots in my, in my boats, you know, all day. So that can be a little troublesome, but other than that, bro, it's, it's pretty low key and pretty simple. Since you mentioned aqua traction, how has that been helping on the knees since you've that's, been running that? Yeah, that's the game changer for me is, is just at, at, at 53 with all the time on the water that I spend to, to have that, option in my boat is is a blessing i noticed right away and, and what happens is i take delivery of my new boat and then it takes my guy ben fort uh, southern tide customs it takes him a little while that he's got to measure my boat and you know so i'll go sometimes a month where i'm running trips again without it in my boat and then when i get it back and it gets installed man night and day just, difference oh it's unbelievable it's unbelievable and there's a lot of people jumping in the marine flooring business and you know, if you see my social media posts and stuff like that, all marine flooring is not the same. No, it's, it's just not. not. It's just like it's just like anything else. There's good and there's bad. And, and aqua traction so far for me has been phenomenal. The stain resistance, the stain resistant quality of that material to me is mind blowing. It looks just like the day we put it in. It's crazy. Now, you know, there are days you got to scrub it a little more because you got kingfish blood on it or, you know, whatever. Customer stuck himself with a hook and now we got customer blood all over it you know dog or uh, not dog but bird bird poop you know from sitting at the marina and sometimes they're eating berries and other things and you got some funky stains you got to scrub a little bit with some simple green but it all comes out and that's really all that matters in that world so um it's pretty cool stuff i'm a big fan lastly when you're not in the gym and that's something I want to do a follow on show with you so that people learn how to fish harder and longer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, de I definitely think that's a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Being, in, being in shape at 53, I can fish pretty hard still because I spend a lot of time pushing my body a little bit. And I think that helps for sure. How can uh, someone best reach you to set up a trip? Oh, they can give us a call. Um, uh, I have a toll free number that comes straight to my cell phone. It's 1 866 Game Fish. And I know you'll probably look at game fish and think, well, that's too many letters, but it doesn't matter. It'll still still ring through to my phone. 
Um, so that's probably the best way to reach me. I do stay, normally I stay about three months scheduled out. Um, but the good news for me is if you're coming to the Tampa Bay area, I've got about 35 full-time guides on staff who um, fish for me on a regular basis. I've got a bunch of charity tournaments that I host and uh, some hotels that send me all their business. And I, I farm them out to my guys that I know are full-time, fish for a living, going to work hard, put people on fish, are good with kids. You know, um, So that way, as you know, not every day is a, a covered in fish day. Um, so if you only catch a few fish, but your charter captain showed you a good time and, you know, all that stuff, you still have a, something to take with you, uh, as you head back to wherever you're from. I think that's important. So I can always get, I can always get you on the water with one of my guys. if I can't take you. Awesome. Brother, I appreciate you spending some time with us today to help educate everybody and love it. We need to do it more often. We need yeah, to get buddy. back on the water too. Amen to that. Amen and, to that. uh, Thanks for joining us today. Give everybody our best, and uh, we will chat soon. I appreciate you, brother. I really do. Thanks for the opportunity here, and uh, tight lines to all your listeners. Thank you, sir. See you, buddy. Hope you enjoyed our show today and found it both educational and entertaining at the same time. If you or your company would like to join the team on Flats Nation for a podcast or other coverage, feel free to drop us a quick note at info at flatsnation.com. And now, here is the rest of the song to run the skiff back home with. Tight lines and God bless. <laughs>